Hello everyone, welcome you all to this session today. Uh, the initial uh, this session is about one hour from now, so 5 to 6 p.m. So we're going to have professors from IIIT joining us. And the initial about 40 minutes, we're going to be talking about the AI application in biometrics. Then you'll have also opportunity to ask your questions. And please keep posting your queries under the chat. And we will respond to you appropriately at the right in time. And welcome you all. So to start with, let me welcome uh, Professor Anu. Professor Anu, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so the idea for today is to uh, talk about this uh, two aspects of uh, that we are discussing today. One is that of uh, AI in general, that artificial intelligence is creating waves in the current uh, industry. Uh, it has been developing for many decades, but uh, recently it has uh, gained so much of prominence and uh, the impact of that AI has a large number of domains and uh, this is something that uh, uh, has significant impact in terms of how we approach solutions now and that's the reason why now industry is uh, significantly uh, picking this up and Specifically, we are uh, going to talk today about uh, biometrics, where we talk about identification of people based on uh, their physiological characteristics. And uh, this, uh, how does AI inform that area of, uh, I mean, it, it used to be called AI in the past, but now it has yeah. uh, become far more, AI has become far more prominent in the area. So the idea is to basically over this uh, the, the high level topics. So uh, I would like to uh, start out with uh, talking a little bit about uh, what has happened in AI in the past and then uh, let's try to connect with metrics from there. Uh, so artificial intelligence is not something new. Uh, it has been around for uh, probably uh, 1940s uh, it got started. And uh, during that time, uh, the idea was that is it possible for a machine or a circuitry to replicate what a human brain does mm. and how that would uh, lead to solutions that were otherwise not possible. And this idea of uh, being able to create solutions that replicate humans but drove the interest towards uh, what you call as uh, AI. And AI itself, there are uh, multiple aspects of it. There is uh, what we call as artificial special intelligence or ASI and also artificial general intelligence where you are talking about uh, uh, the larger uh, issue of uh, you know can an AI system replicate every aspect of what a human does. So that's, that's typically what we call as AGI or artificial general intelligence. Okay. So this uh, is the, the high level uh, thing that we are, we are talking about. Now the question is how did this uh, system evolve? How, what, what happened to AI as a whole. AI, as I said, started in the 1940s where we, people started asking the question of how we can simulate. Mm -hmm. And there were fundamental questions also be, uh, asked at that time as to whether it is at all possible for a system to be intelligent. Mm -hmm. And then people started asking the question, what does it mean by intelligence? So it's, it's, a, it's a far more deeper issue. We don't have the time today to go into the depth of it. Uh, but essentially, intelligent systems are those which uh, are able to perceive something from the world around it and be able to react accordingly. Uh, so if you if your behavior does not change at all based on uh, what is happening around you, then you are not intelligent. Um, uh, if you you keep then you are just basically behaving like a machine yes. which repeatedly doing the same thing or other possibilities repeatedly doing random things. Yeah. Unless you uh, respond to what is happening around you. Uh, then you are not uh, considered intelligent. That's the uh, the uh, high level uh, uh, thing that we want to talk about AI. Now, given that definition that you are responding to, the question is like, at what level do you think of systems as intelligent? And there is this belief in people that, okay, a cert certain level something becomes intelligent and before that it is not intelligent. That's not necessarily the case. It's kind of a continuum. So, even systems that do uh, simple uh, adjustments 
let's say there is an air conditioning here which adjusts the cooling according to the temperature in there there is a feedback that is taken from the environment and the system behaves right. differently de depending on the, the conditions inside and hence you can think of the system as being uh, interfered yes. but that's a very very crude form of intelligence right. now the question is how many such different layers of intelligence do you want to build right. before you can start calling something as uh, intelligent and uh, you know even things like bees honey bees which is uh, able to do a large number of tasks mm -hmm. Uh, it has got multiple levels of intelligence to it. It has, uh, you know, it reacts to the presence of honey uh, right. in a certain place. It is able to navigate to a particular place, pick up the honey and come back. It's able to communicate that information to other, uh, you know, fellow right. members in the hive. Yeah. Uh, it does uh, what you call as the bee dance to communicate this. Yeah. Uh, and it also has very strong social order in there. There is a queen bee, there are worker bees, there are soldier bees, yeah. uh, all kinds of things. And yeah. it's a very, very complex social order. And if yeah. for some reason, some soldier bees die, then uh, some of the worker bees become soldier bees. They change roles. If the queen bee dies, some, some other bee becomes queen bee. It's a very, very complicated uh, uh, situation, uh, the, yeah. the, the social order that is created, all with a very, very small uh, brain. The size of the brain of a bee is probably the tip of a pin uh, that you have. It's as small as that. Mm -hmm. So. The idea is that thinking about the, you know, once uh, scientists understood this, they thought maybe if a bee can do uh, mm -hmm. with such a small uh, brain circuitry, can do so much of intelligent behavior, right. then uh, maybe we can actually replicate this. And that is where the start of uh, uh, AI started, uh, that, you know, trying to replicate this kind of brain, yeah. not necessarily human level brain yeah. replication, but even a bee level mm -hmm. brain replication can have significant impact. So that was the, the motivation to move towards that. And uh, from there, we uh, started our journey. And there were lots and, uh, of ups and downs in the, the history of AI, starting from 1940s and 50s all the way to 2010s. And uh, somewhere around uh, 2010 or 12, uh, suddenly uh, newer techniques started uh, working much better in practice. And we have seen a huge surge of AI and uh, machine learning into this this area so that's just to kind of uh, set uh, set the background yeah. okay so uh, yeah so if you uh, have any initial questions i would be yeah. happy to look at it uh, in the meanwhile uh, and then we will get into specifics of ai and then specifics of biometrics any questions at this time yeah saying is it is there an issue with uh, sound is everybody able to hear no, sir. Some yeah. uh, people are saying that it's not audible or visible. I hope you are. Yeah. You're audible. At least it's visible for sure. Uh, please uh, yeah. tell us if it is audible. Okay. In the meantime, let me also invite the guest. Uh, another guest, Professor Ramesh Loganathan, is here. So let me welcome him. So he's just going to join us. Uh, in about a minute, he's going to join us. So if you have any questions, then probably we can start with that to set the overall context and then move on from there on. Okay. Thank you, Harsh. I think uh, it's obvious. It's, it's clear. Okay. So we will now have uh, uh, Professor Ramesh Lubnathan also joining us and uh, we will uh, carry on this as a conversation rather than trying to uh, talk about this as a monologue. So. Uh, in a minute, he'll be uh, joining us. Uh, somebody is commenting that we have is a curious example. The uh, question is how different is AI from automation? Okay. So, uh, so this, uh, I, I took the example of Beehive uh, just to say that even uh, small uh, elements of uh, feedback and behavior, when combined together at a larger scale, can create behavior that sounds highly intelligent uh, so the the level of intelligence that uh, for doing such a complex behavior is the computational requirement is not so high is uh, what is being taught to us by the uh, by the world so just to uh, set an example of what what we should think of intelligence let's not you know suddenly jump into the realm of uh, super intelligence and so on even uh, smallest level of intelligence can actually have significant uh, uh, practical utility uh, for that matter. 
okay uh, let's just pick one more question and then we will move forward uh, what is the actual meaning of artificial intelligence and uh, is ai any different from learning a computer language uh, yes so both are uh, interesting questions uh, so what is the meaning of artificial intelligence it's just that you know we we talked about intelligence what it is as it's a system that behaves uh, intelligently or differently depending on the stimulus or environment that it is in and uh, uh, as long as the artificial system can do that we call it as artificial intelligence that's all, that's all so any artificial system that would behave uh, display intelligent behavior we call it as uh, ai uh, so ai need not be something that is uh, you know scary and uh, humongous it, it can be very simple systems that actually behave uh, intelligently and the second question was uh, how is learning ai different from learning a computer language well uh, in uh, computer language this this, this if you're talking about like suppose you know one a programming language let's say c or python or one of those languages and then you're trying to learn a new language like you know java or whatever your favorite language is uh, then uh, the the structure of thinking doesn't change when you learn a new computer language all you need to know is the new set of words that are to be used for uh, you know uh, interacting in that in that new language whereas uh, learning about ai is slightly different uh, we don't have time to go through the whole process but it's required significant change in the style in which you think if you want to become an ai uh, engineer so that's that's one of the critical differences between learning uh, a thing like ai i don't call it as a skill uh, it is fundamentally a way of thinking so you have to acquire that way of thinking to be able to you know if you want to call it as ai enabled uh, software developers so that's that's important okay uh, so I guess uh, we will then move on to our uh, discussions about uh, AI and biometrics. Uh, and, uh, leave it, leave generic AI talk at for a little time. later. At least we'll come back to it. Uh, if you have any questions, we would be happy to take it a little later. So uh, mm -hmm. just on to the topic, Anu. I mean, yeah. right, so, so we all know biometrics as like fingerprints, and and yes. to some it goes beyond that. For most people, biometric is fingerprints. Yes. And. Uh, but can you just elaborate? I mean, when you look at it from a biometric lab standpoint, mm -hmm. research standpoint, what all comprise uh, of bio? I mean, what all come uh, into picture when we talk about biometrics? Okay. So, I mean, as a definition, biometrics is just the process of uh, identifying a human being based on their physiological or behavioral characteristics. So, when I say physiological, it means your body characteristics. It could be your face, it could be your fingerprints, it could be your iris patterns in your eyes, it could be your ear shape, whatever it is. Gate. Uh, gate. Uh, so, uh, so the next step is what you call as behavioral characteristics. That is how you behave. And uh, when you act in the world, certain signals that we send out and gate is one such thing. So, uh, gate actually uh, changes based on the way you, it has a relationship to your body structure because how you walk is hmm. fundamentally based on your body structure. But that can change a bit based on whether you have a. So it is not static. You know, it's not. It's far more variable than uh, 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 something like a fingerprint or piece. Huh. Uh, so if you have a pain in the leg, then the way you walk uh, suddenly changes. Or if you gain or lose some weight, the way you walk uh, changes. So it's it's far more uh, you know variable. For example, your voice is a behavioral characteristic because when you speak, the sound comes out, and that also varies significantly based on whether you have a cold or. You know, if you have a sore throat, these things can significantly affect, affect behavioral characteristics. So that's it's not absolutely good. certain, or deterministic. Sometimes it can vary. So that's that's a very important point. Like we have this impression that uh, you know we even use fingerprint as a as a uh, as a word immutable, that, immutable, unchanged, unchangeable, yes. uh, you know, absolute uh, impression of identity that that comes out. Uh, even fingerprint is not absolute. Uh, because the, the problem is that in any uh, uh, biometric system, the input that you get has always got some noise in it. And what do you mean by noise? Noise means that the way you image your fingerprint creates, let's say, for example, when I smudge. press my huh. uh, fingerprint, it can smudge, it can deform your skin, your skin is uh, flexible, it can deform the skin, uh, and then depending on the characteristics, so like if it is a dry day, your uh, uh, you know the atmosphere is dry then uh, your skin would be dry and that would uh, leave a different kind of impression as opposed to if it is humid and if you're there's a slight amount of sweat on your hand 
that would behave differently so a single person same fingerprint would manifest differently at different times so is, is that where ai comes in because you would think like a fingerprint is an image matching and image matching is like not very little i mean need for ai if you want to do an exact match so that's that's absolutely where the problem starts so when uh, this is another aspect of ai that i wanted to uh, discuss before that what is the difference between what ai used to be like 50 years back and what is it has happened now fundamentally is a different uh, uh, the difference is in the amount of uncertainty that is there in the system so old times ai was basically what you call as an expert system it was a set of fixed rules and it behaves based on that later on uh, when uh, what happened is that you know when you took up problems like let's say chess playing even then the inf- information about the world is absolutely known you know where the pieces are you know what the rules are you know what moves you can make based on that what the opponent can make but the only problem was that the the scope of uh, moving is so large that you cannot afford to actually check everything and then we need to have intelligent quote unquote intelligent strategies to uh, move forward in the game but even then there was no uncertainty in the system the only uncertainty was really brute force relying on the computing power to uh, it's seemingly intelligent but not really intelligent not really intelligent in that sense but that's that's another problem that you know any time a system attains a level of intelligence now people say that oh that's not intelligent something else is intelligent then people said that what if the information itself is uh, fuzzy or uh, probabilistic so you know examples like ibm's watson which uh, you know won the jeopardy game it had to actually work in a area where the information itself is probabilistic or uh, noisy hmm. you get information from the internet large amount of information some of them can be contradictory some of them are uh, not so just figuring correct. out what is right figuring out what is right out of it and this is always a probabilistic process saying that oh, how confident are you about this information so you need to be able to act in presence of uncertainty hmm. so now the uncertainty level has gone up when you come talk about watson and for that you require a higher level of intelligence so that's that's where the next generation of intelligence came in Hmm. and then the latest ones actually include also inter- uh, uh, noise in the or uncertainty in the the information that you sense hmm. like your images or speech and things of like that where or language where you don't speak very structured grammatically correct sentences so there is uncertainty or noise in the information that you capture there is uncertainty in the information that you know and then you still need to interact and work in that that kind of a situation hmm. so that's where really the the Uh, the requirement of ai or uh, uh, so in the images what could have certainty i mean like in mm-hmm. voice yes uh, fingerprint mm-hmm. also things can change but if you are generally looking at images say facial recognition what all the uncertainties that like a system needs to adapt and learn from so uh, fundamentally if i take two images of uh, my face you, know, you are looking at uh, my face if i turn my face around uh, the appearance changes like the position of the nose eyes ears and all that changes when you rotate your head depending on the lighting on your face things change depending if i uh, grow a little bit of stubble then the face changes if i comb my hair differently then the face changes so there's a lot of change if i put on a pair of uh, spectacles then the uh, the face again changes so there's a lot of change in the face at some level what a human being can do very naturally we can That's... make out that like the hair style of the person has changed or the per- same person with the beard now yes sometimes we can't remember by and large we can detect that now you to make build that intelligence into the system so there are two aspects to it that i would like to talk about yes human beings do this without our own knowledge we have built in circuitry in our brain which actually does fundamentally dedicated to face recognition for example a significantly large portion of our brain because that is so important in our social context and because of that uh, you know and this happens subconsciously very subconsciously yes. you don't even realize it you just look at a person oh i i know you are ramesh it doesn't matter uh, you know whether you have uh, you know wearing a hat today or differing wearing a different specs it doesn't matter so that aspects that you know our brain is able to to kind of separate these information out and you know understand the identity uh, for a computer that is not at all trivial some things that we think is natural or trivial it's not at all trivial for a computer and the fact that you think is trivial is what makes the problem so difficult for us to solve hmm. the fact when you say it is trivial in other sense what you're really saying is well i can do it but i don't know i have, I have no clue how i'm doing it i think that's where the difficulty comes that's where the, the subconscious difficulty thing comes. we don't know how we're doing it we just do it we just do it and we don't know how we do it so hence we cannot instruct a computer to say oh this is how you should recognize a face 
because I don't know how I'm doing it. How do I tell the computer? So you cannot program it in. And so a where are the models coming from? Like to say now that there's no way to decipher how a human brain is thinking. Yes. I mean, so there are studies happening, but we haven't figured that out yet. Yes. So what are the models that we are? I mean, where are the models coming from? I mean, is there some? Uh, what's the inspiration for the models in terms of how to recognize more these uncertainties? Okay. So uh, again, in the development of uh, a, both AI and biometrics, in the earlier time, uh, we used to ask the question: How do we, uh, as uh, people, how do we uh, recognize a face? And uh, people started saying, you know, the shape of the uh, eyes, the size of the nose. So then uh, people said, okay, let's try to do that. Let's try to encode this into a computer. Let's try to measure the distance between the eyes of different points in the eyes, tip of the nose, mm -hmm. tip of the lips, and stuff like that. And then make all those measurements and say that a human being's uh, face is characterized by those distances. So that's one way to go about it. But then there was a limit that we were hitting mm. that uh, we were not able to go beyond that. And what happened in both biometrics and in AI in general is this emergence of a subfield called machine learning. So when machine learning came along, what machine learning says is that, you know, Understand that you are trying to solve a problem for which you don't know how you are solving it. So then if you don't understand, don't try to encode your ignorance into it. You take a step back and tell the computer what you are supposed to solve. <coughs> you are supposed to look at the face and say this is Ramesh. You are supposed to look at this face and say this is Anu. So if that is the case and if the machine can figure out What's how common? to do the mapping, what is common between multiple images of my face and what is it different from, you know, uh, a face of yours that let the machine figure it out. And in the process, what happened is that we developed algorithms that can actually extract information from your face, which is far more than just lengths between hmm. tips of nose and stuff like that. And that's where the impact has come. And now with machine learning, you are now able to create solutions which are far more uh, powerful, far more accurate than what was possible in the past. In the past, it was like, you know, you have fingerprints, which had a very high level of accuracy because things are far more deterministic there. Hmm. Uh, you can understand what a fingerprint is. You have fingerprint experts who are actually doing fingerprint matching. So they so could tell how it is. They done. could tell how they are doing and hmm. we could actually replicate that. And that was actually giving a, a, a good level of accuracy. So at some level that became a little less of intelligence because you can encode it now. You can encode the it. you encode it, it's not necessarily intelligence anymore. Well, it is still intelligent, but the point is that we don't consider it as intelligent right. because there's no uncertainty in it yeah we've so, encoded you know exactly what to look for so we have this fascination of calling intelligence something that we don't understand anytime yeah. we understand something we say it's oh no now, now that is not intelligent. Now. <laughs> because that's just a standard process you just follow an algorithm you get there yeah. that's not intelligence the intelligence is something beyond, beyond, yeah. beyond it yeah. so now with machine learning what has happened is that you just present the machine with examples of phases and the identity and the machine learns how to map from uh, image of a face to a uh, person's identity even in fingerprints, mm -hmm. while at some level, yes, if you apply the uh, the methodology used by fingerprint experts, it yeah. would probably be encoded to a very static rule. You mm -hmm. look for these, these things. These yes. are the points to locate. Yes. You identify these points. There will be some uncertainty in identifying those points. Once you identify the points, it's a match. It's a, uh, but it's a standard algorithm. The, you were referring to some time back saying like when you press hard, the fingerprint can change. They can deform if it's dry. Is that an area where you would still think traditional machine learning applies to figure out that these things have happened? So there are there are different levels. So uh, typically we used to look at that uh, from a more uh, fundamental signal processing level in the past. But the kind of variations that are possible is not just because of the pressure that you apply, but also because of the, the environmental conditions, uh, mm. the condition of your skin and so on and so forth. So now uh, what is happening is that when an expert looks at a smudgy, mm. not so clear fingerprint, they can uh, actually uh, ignore uh, you know, distractions in that fingerprint in terms of cuts or parts of which is uh, not very visible, blurred mm -hmm. and so on. They can see through it and kind of guess where so, the lines in the fingerprint go. Huh. And now the question is, can you teach the computer to do that? And that is something that the expert don't, again, this mm -hmm. gets in the realm of things that you do naturally or intuitively. That becomes difficult to communicate. So that's what happened in the recent past when machine learning came in came in into the system. Hmm. It's now able to do things that the experts were doing involuntarily or subconsciously. subconsciously. Huh. And now even fingerprint algorithms have improved significantly because of that. Uh, Would uh, kind of like say the spoofing come in the same realm? 
I mean, a fingerprint expert can easily make out this is not a. I mean, I, they can make out that this is a photocopy of a fingerprint and not a real finger. Yeah. Now, is there also an area where? Uh, so that's that's a completely different area that uh, we will get into, and uh, that's that's the area of what you call as spoofs. Spoofs are basically fake fingerprints that I can create a mold of my fingerprint and then. You know, using some kind of a material that re resembles a skin, hmm. I'll create an impression of my finger, my fingerprint, and then I can use it to, uh, you know, give my attendance in some place, whatever, whatsoever. Hmm. And these kind of things are happening. Now the question is, can you look at that Detect. image and figure out is it uh, actually a, a real finger or is it a spoof finger? Yeah. And that's one of the critical security vulnerabilities in a biometric. Has it system. been solved right now? Are there any approaches to, a, to, to a large extent, it has been solved now. Uh -huh. uh, we have had reasonably good solutions for it, hmm. purely based on images, far more than we could uh, imagine at that point. It's it's highly accurate. So it is the machine can figure out the difference between a latex or whatever is being used, absolutely, and a real fingerprint. Yeah, uh, finger. Okay. But this is like any other security. This is a cat and mouse game. Uh, you so you solve it, then then somebody else comes up with a new material that looks that more, more like real. a finger. Uh -huh. You know, and you know this. You, you keep uh, developing algorithms to beat it. Now you develop new new materials. So this is this is like any other security it's a continuous game. process. It's yeah. a it's a cat and mouse game that keeps uh, uh -huh. uh, you know doing one up and the other uh, all the time. That that keeps happening, and that's the 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 researcher's job to kind of keep uh -huh. pushing the envelope in this particular case. Uh, but machine learning really helps in that. Now when it comes to like say iris, mm -hmm. are there any difference between like say fingerprint and iris? Face face we understand, fingerprint we kind of understand. Iris, are there any differences in terms of how iris is used for biometric or they are again similar images? And So iris uh, is an interesting case where it was not uh, a very popular biometrics before computers came along. So it's every iris, human iris is basically what you see in the, the black region of your eye or dark region of your eye. If you uh, so lay eye, it looks similar. If we were to look at it, if a we, normal human being can't make all the difference. No, the problem is that it's so random looking that we cannot see any pattern in it. Huh. So it's slightly difficult for a human being to match two irises and say, oh, these two actually match. Hmm. Okay? You can do it to some extent, <clears throat> but not as accurate as uh, uh, machines. Hmm. Machines can actually look at those patterns and this randomly looking pattern and extract out information which can be matched at a far more and the fail is frequency. static as a biometric, it's a good biometric? It's a very good biometric for multiple reasons. One is unlike fingerprint, which we used to work all the time and you get cuts and bruises and yeah. uh, dry and callus and stuff like that on, on our fingers, your eye, you protect with your life. Yes. Any small thing happens, you close your eye and your eyes, iris is something that is behind your cornea and it lives in a highly protected environment. Hmm. So the chances of you having uh, damages in the iris is very low. Hmm. So because of that, it actually is uh, very effective in large number of cases. Huh. Uh, and uh, but still, there are issues. You can, if you have a cataract, for example, and some kind of diseases in the eye, that can affect the patterns in the, hmm. in the iris. So can the system detect that this is not uh, like as, as a biometric? Uh, can it detect that like this is an iris with a cataract, or it's an iris with some other? We can do that. So damage. we can do that. So, huh. Uh, well, I don't know of any system that currently exists which actually does explicitly doing that, but it's absolutely but the state possible. of technology is doable. It's absolutely possible. You can at least possible. say that, look, this is not a valid idea, but I can't process because there's you can You can look at it and say that, okay, this is uh, too, I mean, uh, you can even just, I mean, detection of cataract itself is a, is a possibility or detection of different diseases is a possibility through the eye. Huh. And uh, based on that, you can say, uh, you know, your iris is actually pristine or is it actually having some damage hmm. and you can detect that you can and you so can at least not make an erroneous notice notify that That's it is uh, not at this point okay, okay. yes the, the other uh, so just before going into some of the other aspects like in terms of how to handle biometrics at scale and such what are from an ai standpoint uh, what the facets of ai that come into play when it comes to biometrics what are types of different types that come into play Okay, so AI and biometrics, they have a very uh, kind of a interesting relationship. Uh, one thing is that, as I said, AI is a, a, an artificial system that behaves differently based on the environment. And as far as humans are concerned, one of the most important aspects of that environment is the presence of other human beings. Hmm. So if an AI system is talking to me, I want it to talk to me and not just talking to any random other person. So if it can change its behavior based on who it is talking to, then that is a very useful thing to have. Mm. 
and uh, you you know you don't have to say certain things to me uh, which you have to tell to other people and uh, vice versa so recognizing people is one of the key aspects of recognizing your environment hmm. and behaving appropriately so it's not just so, a security thing it's much more than that it's much more than that so if if you want to have a good ai it has to have the ability of recognizing people hmm. so from for a pure ai perspective by you know recognizing people which is basically biometrics is a key component of being able to have an ai hmm. now you can also say the reverse where there are two so recognize of i need ai yeah. so but that is basically a, a you know kind of a false uh, loop because what you are essentially saying is that there are techniques that you use to develop ai which can actually help in uh, biometrics like machine learning huh. so machine learning is something that enables ai and machine learning can also help in uh, developing better machine uh, better biometric algorithms so the way so, we do machine learning like supposing it's voice biometrics mm-hmm. uh, which is more of a signal that's coming uh, yes. and then there's an image which is at some level a signal still but we know it's a, it's a super signal we know there's an image or a fingerprint which is a fingerprint little bit more than just an image mm-hmm. we know that it's a fingerprint yeah so at this thing when we look at say even machine learning are these handled any differently or is there any difference in how you handle a voice signal versus how you handle an image versus yes. how you handle a fingerprint yes so in terms of the the sensing part or the perception part of any uh, signal in ai it is highly dependent on the nature of the signal so the way i process an image would definitely be different from the way i process a sound signal which would be different from how i process a mri scan which would be different from how you uh, are processing the uh, say for example text hmm. uh, for recognizing what is going on so the nature of uh, this thing is highly different uh, and you need to have appropriate mechanism to process these different signals hmm. so for voice traditionally has come from uh, what you call signal processing background uh, so trying to extract different frequencies out of the voice hmm. and using that to filter out noise hmm. and pick out information that is relevant to recognizing a speech also information that is relevant to recognizing who the speaker is hmm. so these are all uh, related but the information primarily has been from uh, the traditional approach of signal processing primarily from a signal processing background, background. Huh. Uh, and so has been the, the case with images hmm. for a long time but in the case of images because you are looking at a 3d world hmm. there is also aspects of geometry that is thrown into it so there is some signal processing aspects and then there is geometry that is layered on top of it hmm. and there on top of it there is photometry and stuff like that so you put all those things together hmm. you get some level of understanding of the world and fingerprint while it's an image is there any difference between the way you handle fingerprints versus face yes absolutely uh, because usually uh, you know fingerprints the way you sense it is typically by putting your fingers on top of a a glass plate and imaging it from the bottom of the glass plate mm. so the contact of your finger with the glass plate is what actually generates the image mm. and that is a far more controlled environment as opposed to when you image your face mm. so typically so it's relatively easier to process fingerprints relatively relatively speaking, easier yes than uh, face yes. but then there are also you know more amount of deformations possible in the fingerprint because you're pressing against a, 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 a glass plate hmm. as opposed to face which would you know you're not pressing it against anything so it would be easier to recognize hmm. in, in in some sense so it, there are pros and cons of both before we go to the questions mm-hmm. uh so the what are the, what are happens at the biometric lab okay so at the biometrics lab at triple it uh, we do work on mostly cutting edge problems in biometrics uh so as a research lab we typically look at problems that are not yet solved or rather there is significant amount of uh, uh, effort required before it is hmm. we call it as solved hmm. none of the problems are really completely solved uh, all the problems still <coughs> require like you know a, a bit more effort uh well i i shouldn't say this because uh i i would say that 95% of the problem is solved huh. But, but the 5% is the 5% probably as hard as the 5% requires probably as much effort as the first 95%. Uh-huh. So that's typically where most of the problems in biometrics. And that's true with most machine learning areas, right? I yeah. mean, the accuracy, as you go higher, higher, every percentage point accuracy is that much harder. Yes. So, so I think the easier way to say that, you know, it's not like 95, which is 5 away from 100. If, if you want to think of it, it's easier to think of in terms of error rates. Say currently I have, let's say, 4% error rate. Hmm. to decrease it to 2% you need i need to have some amount of effort and to go from 2 to 1 you'll have similar amount of effort 
one to half it'll have a similar amount of effort so huh. you would require infinite such efforts to actually get to get 100% to huh. so the the, the accuracy to 100% or error to 0 so is it's there what is the, ladder so uh, the other aspect is the whole scale aspect of this right yes. i mean there's one thing to say like i'm just checking one image one person is this image again a biometric i've gone and uh, given some it's a two factor i've shown that it is me my picture is there so system only has to validate like a pin yes right saying it's already they know this image where put my card also it has to validate me against my image uh, and make sure it's me yes but there are other cases where you don't know who it is yes from a, like in an airport for instance you just look at the image and you're trying to find who it is mm-hmm. what are the challenges with scale i think that's we are getting there now i mean it's no longer a simple biometric where at yeah, access point you're comparing two images it's now like a pretty things like other and such what are the challenges with scale so uh, in case of biometrics uh, traditionally we always talk about these two types of uh, uh algorithms one is called uh, biometric verification the other is called biometric identification and in the case of uh, verification you are talking about one to one matching okay uh, you have as you said you have you have already proclaimed that you are ramesh huh. so i just compare your picture huh. that is in my database with the picture that i am capturing right now so it's just a simple one to one matching that's verification identification means i'll just capture your face you don't tell anything i compare it against everybody in your database and say okay your face matches with ramesh hence you are ramesh so that's uh, the identification problem hmm. now the scale comes in when this database becomes really large which has happened with the case like uh, atha huh. the problem with uh, large scale is that the requirements of accuracy is extremely high hmm. so so it's a double whammy it's the a database whammy. is large, large and therefore also the accuracy also has to be very high it takes a lot of time to even match which means you want to have algorithms that are very very efficient the doppelgangers coming to play here now you will find some people that are similar to you <laughs> that's that's always there if you, if you give your face and you compare against a billion in the world uh, in the case india there somebody, somebody would really resemble close, you yes. so you need to have a highly accurate matching algorithm but then it also has to be extremely efficient so that you can actually do the matching against a billion huh. so this is a uh, is the technology there today so actually the technology has reached uh, there today so that's huh. the reason why something like aadhar has become possible huh. that uh, it is uh, you know Uh, as i said nothing is 100% but uh, the chance of you matching with a random person is less than 1 in 1000 that is 0.1% mm-hmm. uh, so that's the level of accuracy that is not possible that's now possible mm-hmm. uh, note that you know if you are trying to talk about an identity system yeah. you should also look at the alternative where you are going there with a some kind of an id card or a you know ration card or whatever birth certificate what is the chance that your birth certificate is correct hmm. or that can be spoofed it's far easier than uh, doing something like a uh, fingerprint or a face hmm. so uh, i think you know th- that we are able to ascertain the identity of a person with 99.9% confidence hmm. is is something that is remarkable that, that is possible at a scale at, and uh, probably the india. challenge that we will have in india with our 1.1 or 1.2 billion population is probably i don't think any other country will have to deal with that you uh, uh that scale absolutely so, so our problem is much more uh, complex that's true so we have, we have a really uh, difficult problem at that and it's remarkable that we are able to solve, able it, to solve uh, it for with padar and now the issues in terms of research has primarily gone into things like spoof is one issue huh. uh, which we work on in our lab uh, on how to detect spoofs and how to do things like detection of spoof as well as matching hmm. how do we do this together and these kind of problems that we are attempting hmm. now hmm. Uh, looking into and another aspect that we have been looking at is uh, one of the fundamental questions in biometrics that people are worried about hmm. that is about the privacy issue hmm. so the question is uh, if i don't want to reveal my true identity is it possible for me to uh, suppress that hmm. and still be able to avail benefits that are that are tied to my identity hmm. so for example if i want to go to a, a, a gym and enter it and all that the the gym door has to make sure is that i am one of the members hmm. it doesn't have to know who i am hmm. so is it possible to reveal only that much information that is required to avail the services hmm. and mask away everything else and we have been developing uh, uh, solutions that you can actually prove that uh, you know you will not reveal any information beyond What, what, minimally is, required. what is minimally required for that so such solutions are possible so this is a different kind of privacy concern so if you look at what you hear in the news mm-hmm. and everything privacy essentially saying like my data got leaked 
mm-hmm. from whoever is keeping my data. Yes. It could be a bank, could be somebody else. Who are, the, the worry is only about the data leaking. Now, this is a completely different dimension to privacy. If I say that it's not about a leak, I want to be authenticated, but I would want them to know only as little as they need to know. That's if true. they need to know that I'm a member of the gym, that's all they need to know. They should, not be, they should not know who it is. So that's an amazing, it's a different dimension to privacy. So, uh, so from an academic point of view, we are trying to develop solutions that are, you know, uh, theoretically the absolute minimum information that you want to reveal, you want to reveal that and still be able to get all the benefits of biometrics where, you know, somebody can actually prove hmm. in case there is a legal uh, hmm. problem, you can yeah. actually prove that it was you were fingerprint that was put yeah. or a, a valid fingerprint that was put and a valid matching went on. So yeah. you, you should have some audit trail yeah. which can la- later be used. For example, if I use my fingerprint to withdraw money from my bank and then later on, if you claim that, oh, I did not withdraw that money, the bank should be able to say that no, because this match happened, hmm. it has to be your fingerprint. So there should be, so there should be that, much of, that much of certainty should be there yeah, so that you can prove it. At a certain point, they should be able to prove it. but. Uh, while doing the authentication, you don't want your information to be revealed. So, hmm. so there is both should be possible, huh. and uh, there are in, interesting dilemmas in that. So, we are trying to look at uh, problems that can that can solve that. So, there hmm. are fundamental contradictions between this field of cryptography, which actually deals with this, and AI. Suddenly, they they are kind of converging here. Now. Uh, Some of the models we are be... we are trying to make them converge. They don't like each other at all. <laughs> uh, so because for them it's probably deterministic. It's highly they, there's deterministic. There's no machine learning. There's no artificial in what they do. So as far as privacy is concerned, or encryption kind of things are concerned, if there's a minor variation in the input, the encrypted version should be extremely different. Huh. So that so, there is, so that you cannot map it back. Huh. Whereas uh, you know machine learning and AI says that if two minor variants of the same face come in. We want to recognize it as the same face. Huh. So fundamentally, these two fields are trying to the, push. The paradigms uh, are very different. Yeah. So in one case, you're trying to push things which are very similar together. Hmm. The other one is trying to push uh, similar things away. Huh. And then we need to create solutions in this uh, kind of a space. It's a very interesting problem. What is interesting? Very interesting convergence. It presents an opportunity to solve absolutely uh, these kind of problems. So uh, we have 15 minutes. So we will take uh, some of the questions. Uh, yes. Some we've already covered. Uh, mm-hmm. Say, okay, this is an interesting question. Um, how have iPhones fundamentally uh, almost championed the face recognition and taking photos? Face okay. recognition is more relevant for us. Okay. So, uh, I don't know whether really iPhones have championed it, uh, but I'm sure at least in the popular consciousness, iPhones have actually... Uh, the first ones that have taken it very, very mainstream. There, yeah. are, there are other companies which did it before that, but the point is that when Apple does it, the scale at which they get yeah. uh, pushed it, it gets noticed and uh, they have actually used uh, some uh, nice uh, sensors also to do this mm. uh, in addition to just taking a picture they also use uh, infrared uh, sensors as well as infrared projectors to get uh, far so more the uh, yeah the, the 3d shape of the face uh. and then do recognition based on that mm. which actually gives you more information and mm. more uh, robustness to that mm. So, yes, uh, they actually uh, pushed it into the, the mainstream, uh, the idea of face recognition and use that for interacting with your uh, consumer electronic devices. Hmm. So, and this, like if you take like once in this phone, OnePlus has the fingerprint on the screen. Yes. How does that work? Okay. Because it's not a camera. I don't know what's behind it. But uh, so how does that work when... So like there are, the the there are uh, multiple technologies for huh. that. Uh, I'm not sure exactly which one... Uh, uh, OnePlus uses, but I believe from yeah. what I know, OnePlus uses uh, it. It illuminates your fingerprint using the pixels, huh. the the screen itself, and then it senses the light from in between pixels. So there's a kind of a camera sitting behind the screen. Huh. It is partially occluded by the pixels in front of it, hmm. uh, but it is trying to extract sufficient information from that uh, in between fingerprint that you can see to to be able to recognize. Huh. Huh. That's the technology. That and is, maybe their problem also is simplified to some extent because. There may be some 10 fingerprints mm-hmm. registered in the phone. So you, you only have to match against those 10. So you your should, problem is much less complex. Much, much simpler. So the, the threats are usually uh, lesser and usually you can do a more relaxed yes. match. Yes. The sense that if it approximately matches. It's quite it would, likely it to would, be the same. It would pass it. Yes, yes, yes. So, but there are other technologies which also uses ultrasonic sound to, uh, you know, sense through the screen, mm-hmm. which is actually a, a bit more reliable. Mm-hmm. But the technology is still, uh, you know, so that becomes more signal processing. They're not using image anymore. No, they're using signals to 
Yeah, so so uh, it it is using uh, ultrasonic waves and its reflection to actually capture the the, 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 the image the so at every every point, uh -huh. and then based on that you construct uh, the image, reconstruct the image, and then you do the standard. Oh, after it's the same yes. normal processing. Yes. Okay. Yes. This is an interesting question. Uh, it's almost like noise reduction in our headphones. So clearly, it's not AI. I mean, the headphones don't have AI, but some concepts. I'm sure there are similar concepts. If you're talking about signal to noise, you have to figure out what is relevant, what is not. So, what's the similarity between noise cancellation headphones and like, right. and say you refer to noise in a smudged fingerprint? Mm -hmm. What a compare and contrast. What is similar? What is not? Well, uh, the term noise is used by different uh, communities in different ways, uh, and uh, but in this case, that is just similar. There is your signal, which is the primary fingerprint, yes. and there's smudge or other things, which is noise. Yes. Same with headphones. Yes. I want to listen to something. I don't want ambient noise, but I just want to listen to some particular thing. So to the extent the definition is the same, That's though yeah, the, the nature of it is very very different. Very different. So you, usually the the nature of noise in a audio signal is usually additive. Huh. You have a primary clean signal on top of it. There are other. So they're far enough that you can electronically remove it. So there are multiple ways to do it. One is you can have uh, multiple uh, you know microphones and based on that a standard signal processing method is there, which is being used by most of the basic uh, noise cancelling hmm. uh, headphones. But now people are also Trying to put AI into it hmm. to say that uh, you also recognize what kind of voice it is, hmm. what kind of situation you are in, uh, based on the voices that you hear, and the the headphone will decide whether you should be hearing noise from outside or not. So it's not just like constant active noise cancellation; hmm. it's intelligent cancellation of noise. If somebody is coming and talking to you, it should recognize it and say that oh, this voice is important for you. You should not cancel it. Out. Hmm. Uh, whereas if you see a uh, Humming noise of some fan. So, yeah, apart from just background. having a microphone, which is what they normally have, they also going to have a camera now. And well, hopefully you can do it only from the voice, because yeah. otherwise there'd be another. Also, you can recognize that it is somebody coming close to you and talking to you. Yes, I mean, based so on recognize the, based on the nature of the voice. Uh -huh. So it, it does all kinds of you know. Are you in a crowded situation? In which case you'll try to suppress those kind of noise. So there's AI playing there. Uh -huh. also. Yeah, but traditional noise cancellation, no, there is no. Uh, yeah, you can think so that. this again another question relevant. Uh, how, how difficult it is to detect this spoof biometric? So uh, in uh, simple cases, uh, if you use uh, you know there are common materials that people use, it's actually uh, now possible to detect it with a very high level of accuracy. Uh, but there is always a level like you said, of there's uh, a cat and mouse thing okay, that will yes. constantly keep happening. Say for example, face recognition. Uh, if you uh, try to uh, apply some makeup and try to wear a mask uh, with somebody else's face printed on it, it's relatively easy to capture it. Hmm. But there are certain kind of masks. Uh, uh, we have some examples in our lab, which is basically used by you know Hollywood, hmm. where they actually dress up a person as a as a different person and using a you know kind of mask which is so high quality. It is difficult to distinguish, and they go to the level of actually creating even small hair follicles on the face is, you know, implanted on that face. Hmm. So it's it's almost indistinguishable from a few feet away. You will not be able to say it's, uh, no, it's it's a fake. Hmm. It's as realistic as that. So yes, if you can spend, uh, you know, three thousand, five thousand dollars on creating one face mask, you can get very high level of uh, accuracy. I'm yeah. sure there are uh, people that would probably be willing to spend that money uh, to break some system. Uh, yeah, so if, if if you are hell bent on breaking one system, yeah. it's it's very difficult to 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 stop it. Yeah. Of course, there are you can build in. So if it is a highly secure system, you can build in countermeasures for it. I'm not saying that, but yeah. purely from appearance, it can be uh, difficult to to uh, tackle some of these extreme uh, spoofs. But do that's that's very rare. You do those preserve the heat signatures as well? I, I don't know how much of face biometric uses heat of signatures. Now, no. as they as don't of, preserve the heat signatures. As of now, no. So if you use a IR or near IR, you uh, can images, figure you out that there's something in between. Huh. Yes, absolutely. But then of course, it's a question of time. Yes. So you can now say that okay, you will create a heated mask which would have similar heat, the heat, heat characteristics of a piece. Yes. So that's the said. You know, it's always a cat and mouse game. Uh -huh. So this is another interesting question. Uh, can we create some kind of hash with the biometrics and use it as an universal lock? Okay. So this has been uh, something that has been attempted quite a lot hmm. uh, to create a biometric and use it as a kind of a key. Hmm. Uh, but there's one fundamental problem that uh, biometrics are always variable. And uh, 
when those variations happen, hmm. uh, you need to have a mapping function hmm. which would take from that uh, noisy uh, yeah. biometric signal and then uh, convert that into a fixed pattern. If you can do that very well, uh, wonderful. Hmm. Okay, and people have tried to do some variants of these things. There are some solutions that exist like that, uh, but but it's also for a much larger system. It's not just generating the hash. The it's, other system should be able to has, consume the hash. It has multiple layers. Yeah, so it's, it's not, not a simple hash. It's not a self-contained solution it, also. It's not a simple hash. There are multiple levels to it. But hmm. that idea of creating a hash and creating a key, yes, it has been attempted and there are some solutions. I am uh, not, uh, uh, I, I don't believe those solutions are. But then like, I'm, I'm sure there are, there will be others that will believe like my face is the key. Why do I need a hash? I mean, what do you need to do to do it is my face. Uh, the hash is a secondary key now. Mm -hmm. From the face, you're generating a key yes. that's used to unlock something else yes. electronically. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there'll be others that'll argue like, why, I, why do I need intermediate key? My face is the key. Yeah, so that's that's the uh, that's the premise of biometrics. But the problem is that your face is not a static entity. So you so need to map it to something that can be relatively yes, static. For a computer, if it has to match, it has to be relatively static. Huh. So it should be more. It should be linked to me as a person and not that one image. Yes. So that's, the hash that's should somehow be able to. So when you that. say my face. You have some concept in your mind as to what my face is, which is not what you get when you... Which is again finish. very easily done for human beings. I mean, like we, we can, if a human being has to open the door, we'll know it's owns a person, so it's, we can open the door. Uh, but yeah, for the machine to uniquely okay, generate one hash key for that person rather than for the image. No, but it's interesting that current uh, day, the technology has reached a level where, huh. uh, you know, machines are able to do even better than humans. We huh. have limitations. We cannot recognize Computing. more than like, you know, 3000 faces. Yes. More than that, your brain cannot store that many identities or faces in your mind. Huh. Computer can do a billion, no problem. So it's in some sense. Yeah, we, we are highly accurate in smaller scale. Yes. Uh, computers can be like maybe not as accurate as we are, but reasonably accurate as much much larger scale. Much larger scale. Huh. Even accuracy also, it's we have a concept that we are we are highly accurate. But I know I, we probably also think sometimes you have we make mistake. We yeah, make mistakes. Yeah, I thought as you, it looks all like yes. a very common thing we come across nowadays. Yes, and you know you see somebody who oh, this looks like somebody who's that I've seen before. Yeah. Just a similarity that uh, that causes that. And then the other way around also, like I mean, like I know there's a lot of work happening on how features change with age. Yes. Often we can't recognize somebody saying they look. I couldn't recognize you at all. But I'm sure computers can probably recognize. Computers can at least the it can carry you know we can quantify the amount of uh, error error that you make. Yes. Whereas human beings. So talking about be scale. So this again another uh, question which is on many people's minds. Uh, now that we're moving stuff onto mobile devices and such. Yes. What are the I mean like are the algorithms different? Uh, mm -hmm. I know there may be an assumption of scale. Yes. On mobile, you might assume that you're doing things differently from what you might do on a backend. Mm -hmm. But are there other models that are different that can be applied on mobile low compute? Uh, devices compared to backends. Yes, so we do try to do that. Uh, we have, we are also working on some of these uh, mobile-based uh, identity recognition problems. Hmm. Uh, one of the things that is uh, you know become popular with mobile is that it has got a built-in camera. Hmm. Almost every mobile now has got a camera, and you can do face recognition very easily with that. Hmm. Fingerprint you might need a specific sensor for that, but at least in the case of faces. But you don't computing need. sensing is one thing. Sensor, but then the computing itself. So the algorithm different. Two aspects to it. One is that since you are uh, taking the picture with a cell phone and you're taking a selfie, uh, people do all kinds of faces, all kinds of angles, all kinds of lighting, all kinds of background. It can be highly unstructured thing. Hmm. So the images that comes out of a mobile are typically far more variable than that you get in a let's say an ATM kiosk. Hmm. Uh, you walk into the ATM, takes a picture. There's a relatively static, static background. background lighting similar. Lightings are very similar and so on and so forth. It doesn't change so much. So, much. Huh. so that is so one difference. It's contrary to expect expectation, it's other way around. It's probably more complex to compute this mm -hmm. year. So the, uh, the, pro the, no the data itself is more noisy or variable is one aspect. Second is, of course, because of the limitations of the, the computing power there, you need to work with models that are simpler. Hmm. That is, again... So what's the trade-off? Uh, so it's, it's basically... Would be the trade-off or what would be the trade-off? So it's an accuracy versus uh, uh, speed, huh. speed or compute trade-off. Huh. Huh. Memory, huh. compute and accuracy... Huh. A triangle you need to select, uh, you know, huh. one, one or two at most you can get. Huh. And now the question is, you know, how much do we need to give? Hmm. And that has been the one of the important re uh, research areas, not just in biometrics but also in generic AI as to how can we, you know, take these models that now seems to be doing very well for certain kind of tasks. How can I apply it to? Uh, I know uh, the other work uh, that's happening in the computer vision center is on the 
train the for medical imaging, mm-hmm. train the model using high resolution images, but then tra- but detect using low resolution images. Yes. So something like that. So that's that's also possible. Yeah. Uh, so you, during training, you have, typically you do it with full fledged uh, high uh, m- amount of data, large amount of compute. You train the model and then you convert that, that into that in something some that is far hmm. more uh, compact, compress it some way, and hmm. then put it on a mobile phone. That's that's uh, typically hmm. the way that is taken. Hmm. This is again another interesting. Uh, I mean, I'm also curious. Can AI biometrics uh, distinguish between twins? Okay. So, uh, so specifically identical twins. Uh, by identical twin, the definition is that they have they share the same DNA. Huh. So it is that uh, the uh, the egg and sperm join together into a single zygote, and at some point it splits right. into two parts, and then each one huh. independently developed as an individual. Huh. That's that's the definition of identical twin. Huh. So identical twins, by definition, has got the same DNA. So hence, if you use DNA as a biometric, no, you mm. cannot distinguish them. Mm. Uh, in terms of face, sometimes they, the they features see, change. They seem to have some uh, far more similarity than others. So yes, face-based biometrics, uh, identical twins are more difficult to distinguish than. Uh, but at generally. some level, they'll probably be no more dif- difficult than for a human being to recognize. That's true. But uh, so we often being, get. I mean, I have twins in my complex. They are uh, both forty-year-olds. I mean, do you think in 40 years they have kind of grown apart? Even their hair is, hairstyle is similar. Their <laughs> voice is uncannily similar. If I hear them, I can never make out they're two different people. The way they speak is a little different, but the features and the voice. So, I mean, there's also a tendency for twins to kind of, you know, try to be more similar. That's, that's a social It's thing. a very natural thing. A social yeah. thing to happen. Uh-huh. But things like the fingerprints, uh-huh. they are completely different. Well, even for identical yes, twins. Yes. Yes. That's interesting. Uh, uh-huh. So, it is, well, I should say almost as different as two uh, random people. Uh, there is a very small amount of uh, uh, additional similarity, but yeah, practically they are as different as any any two random people. Hmm. So, so that's interesting. So at there's some way of even if they're identical, there's a way to identify yes. uh, who they are. This is again a social question. I mean, how do you get uh, masses to adopt? Uh, how do you get masses to adopt? Uh, like biometric. I mean, I, I, it's still not gone that far, but if it goes to like, I mean, to draw money or to put your fingerprint <coughs> or to get your ration card, direct I benefits. think, uh, you know, it's kind of organically happening. Uh, most of your mobile phones have got a fingerprint lock on it and you are now doing payment using your mobile phone. So practically you're using your, and some of these payment mechanisms can actually ask for a secondary authentication. Whenever it tries to do, make a payment, it will try to verify you again and that you can do with your fingerprint. So you're actually making money transfers with your fingerprint already now. Hmm. Uh, but still small numbers. Like say other link payments haven't yet taken off in a big way. Uh, I mean, fingerprint link. Uh, so when that happens, I mean, so, maybe for us, like uh, we, have, we have leapfrogged a few generations of information system adoption. So maybe we are less worried than many other countries because they have seen bigger scams happen. So maybe we will innocently uh, adopt it more easily as a country. Well, uh, yes and no. It took a lot of uh, effort for people to get convinced. But I think, uh, you know, things like uh, face recognition is not uh, looked upon with the same uh, fear or... Uh, you, you, you think they're more fear. confident about face than fingerprints? I mean, people are comfortable putting their face on. Because they know that we can identify different, but we can't identify what's different between two fingerprints. As, I mean, lay human being, lay but to the lay eye. More than that, there is a kind of social stigma associated to fingerprints. Huh. So when you give a fingerprint, you think that there is Somebody something. Somebody can abuse it. Yeah, something you can abuse it, and there's some something more serious being uh, put out there. Hmm. Whereas face, oh, you know, I don't mind uh, others taking a picture of me. Huh. It's it's as simple as that. So face so, is a more easily it, acceptable. In terms of adoption, yes. It's more higher it, in when it's face. Far easier. Uh, so are there any like I mean the question is on when you look at social adoption biometrics, uh, are there any issues with the scale? Uh, so limitations def- or otherwise definitely right so uh, when you scale some uh, you know technology like this to the whole of uh, india for example it's it's very interesting to see the kind of challenges that comes through hmm. it's not just biometrics but any technology if you want to scale it to huh. every single indian huh. that is a very very difficult challenge because the kind of things that you would never expect would come into the play 
so that is extremely important to understand that any technology that is uh, more than scale it's not so much computing scale it's just the variance in the data and the, the variance in the types data. of the data that you can get and the kind of assumptions that as a human being that you make to build a system yeah. it's not applicable like you know one of the interesting thing is that in uh, for example in aadhar yeah. you ask when a person comes to enroll what is your name what is your address yeah. and you assume that you have got an address and i'm not talking about just homeless people who don't have a permanent address yeah. there are people who don't have the concept of an address what does address mean that you belong to a particular place that yeah. you and a physical space in the world has got some connection yeah. and there are people who believe that you know world is the world and me i am me these are nobody nobody people yeah. like I, yeah. i don't associate myself as belonging to a place yeah. so inherently the concept of address is not there and that such people are suddenly now in several millions now you, you know so the, the the even the small portions of uh, society which has got a very different concept of uh, all these aspects mm. suddenly becomes a big portion of a big number when you talk about scale like india so let alone ai based systems any system that you want to develop at a scale of this you will have uh, interesting challenges that comes mm. and ai will definitely uh, has its own share of it Sure. Good, I think long ways to go, uh, but I think it's interesting to say that it's now directly intersecting. Uh, research and adoption uh, are now kind of very uh, converging, uh, so mm-hmm. to speak. Uh, so thank you so much. I think it's been a fantastic conversation. Uh, there's more information on any of the research centers. Please do check out uh, the research centers: uh, Biomedic Lab, the Computer Vision Center, the Signal Processing Center, uh, Machine Learning Center. These are some of the centers that have the Language Technology Center. uh that uh, kind of come into play when it comes to ai and biometrics so do check check out uh, the sites if you need any more information uh, on the pipeline website and uh, thank you so much thank you for joining us uh this signing off ramesh lognathan uh, faculty of pipeline uh, handling uh, research and innovation outreach and professor anup uh, nambudri who heads the biometric uh, lab thank you thank you